Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for all sticking around until the end. Uh, it will, I, uh, I hope it's uh, worth it because today we can prove a theorem. Um, so I've been talking about groups acting on the circle and specifically actions of surface groups and why these are motivated. Um, we're going to talk about examples that are rigid, that, are, that are, can't, be, can't be perturbed, that deformations are only sort of the most trivial ones you can do. So I want to talk about what does this mean, rigidity, generally. Um, and we've already sort of set up the framework for this. So an informal definition is uh, if gamma is just a discrete group, and G a topological group, we'll say uh, a uh, representation of gamma to G is rigid if, uh, well, informally, uh, it, the only deformations of this are trivial. So all deformations of rho are trivial. Okay, so what's a deformation? Uh, you can think of it uh, as moving continuously along a path in the space of representations. That would be one way to think of a deformation. And a trivial one, well, something you can always do is uh, you can take something in the identity component of G, you could take a path from the identity to somewhere, and you could conjugate by elements along that path. You can always conjugate a representation to change it. Okay, so to formalize this, we'll want to say that rho is an isolated point in the space of representations up to conjugacy. So saying when you quotient, when you kill conjugacy, there's nothing left, there's no room to move. Okay. Except we saw some last time that this space is kind of problematic. Um, you can't actually measure things in it, it's not house if you can't put coordinates on it. So we'll pass to the space where you can actually talk about something. Okay, the biggest house curve quotient, the character space. Okay. So you should think of this as saying that in the only place where you can measure anything, uh, we can actually like see what's going on. Uh, rho has the only deformations of, of rho are by conjugacy. Or if you say a deformation is not just like a path in the representation space, but you you know you're allowed to approximate by an arbitrarily small amount, that's a good way to think of passing to this quotient. Okay. Okay. So that's the informal way, and this is the precise definition. So what's an example of this? Okay. Uh, things that come from geometry give us nice examples. So one of my favorite uh, theorems in mathematics is Mostow rigidity. This is actually what I'm going to state is a weaker form uh, than the full theorem. Um, but it, uh, it implies in particular that uh, if gamma is the fundamental group of a hyperbolic three manifold, a closed hyperbolic three manifold. Okay. Well, uh, gamma sits inside of, uh, sorry, n is fine, n at least three. Gamma, si uh, gamma sits inside the group of isometries of hyperbolic n space as a co compact lattice. Meaning when you take this quotient, you get something compact. And this is here as a discrete uh, subgroup. It embeds there discreetly. So I have a nice representation of gamma into SON1. And Mostow rigidity in particular says that uh, this representation, this embedding as a lattice, is rigid, meaning that it's an isolated point in the character space of representations of this group into SON1. So uh, something that comes from a geometric structure, a hyperbolic structure in this case, gives an example of a rigid representation. 
Uh, this totally fails, right? We've been talking about surface groups. So, uh, right, this fails. This is false for n equals 2, where a closed hyperbolic manifold is a surface. Every surface of genus at least 2 admits a hyperbolic metric. Um, so gamma would be the fundamental group of a surface. Mm -hmm. And for the representations into SO21, which is, as a group, that's the same thing as PSL2R, there's a whole family of the non-conjugate ones. The dimension of this depends on G. It's like 6G minus 6. Okay. Um, but if you pass to a bigger group, one that we've been studying, uh, you can recover an example of rigidity. Okay. Okay. Uh, we do have a rigidity theorem for surface groups. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the following result of Matsumoto uh, from 1987. Um, if you take a surface group, genus at least two, and you put it into, uh, you, you take an action of this group on the circle just by homeomorphisms, okay? Um, but secretly it actually came from putting this into one of these geometric examples, including this into PSL2R as a co-compact lattice. So you put it here as a discrete, discreetly is a discrete subgroup and a faithful representation, and this acts on the circle by Mobius transformations. Okay. Okay. So secretly, it came from this construction. This is my example. And take any one of these you like. Matsumoto's theorem says that this representation or this class is rigid as an action of this group on the circle. So as a representation to homeomorphisms of the circle. Okay. So from last time, this space is representations up to semi-conjugacy. Semi-conjugacy is always a deformation you can just kind of do by hand to find a, to find a map H. Uh, you can actually do these continuously. So uh, saying that all, it's it, the connected component containing rho is a single semi-conjugacy class that's as small as it could possibly be. Okay, so um, let me do a reminder. This is representations or actions. Let's say representations up to semi-conjugacy. Recall. Uh, Matsumoto's theorem says says that these give rigid examples or isolated points of this space. Okay. Uh, and this theorem is really remarkable. Uh, if you are familiar with how you prove Mostat rigidity or Margulis super rigidity or any of these related results, it's all very heavy Lie group theoretic. Here, we don't have a Lie group. There's no Lie algebra to homey of the circle. It's not even finite dimensional. It's super, it's a huge group. There's lots of rooms to perturb things. Um, you know, in, in Lie groups, you have nice things that are true, like every element belongs to a one parameter family. Uh, like a one parameter subgroup. Uh, this is not true in the homeomorphisms of the circle. Um, so all kinds of crazy stuff you might want to do goes completely wrong and, and you have to prove this with a, sort of a fundamentally different approach. Okay. Okay. But it does suggest a kind of a parallel is that things that come from a geometric construction, i.e. like a hyperbolic structure on the surface or embedding your surface into PSL2R, um, retain some kind of dynamical rigidity. You can't perturb them in a dynamical sense. So uh, if we want to find other examples of uh, 
groups acting on the circle that have dynamical rigidity, maybe we can kind of imitate this, 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 this idea uh, and look for lattices inside of Lie groups. So generally, let's say that uh, a group, I don't know, gamma, uh, sitting inside a group of homeomorphisms uh, is geometric. Okay, if C really it comes from this kind of construction, okay, so if there's a Lie group, um, if this representation rho factors through, mm, putting gamma inside of some Lie group as a co-compact lattice, a discrete subgroup with compact quotient, and G acts on uh, your manifold okay, transitively. So M is a homogeneous space for G. Right, I'll put this so that M is sort of the smallest space on which G acts. You wouldn't want this action to only see part of your manifold and not the whole thing. Okay. Okay. So that's my best guess at like what's the phenomenon going on here. Um, and maybe we should look at other examples of geometric group actions on the circle as more candidates for, uh, for, for, for groups that might act rigidly. Okay. So let's just do this. What are the geometric actions in low dimensions on S1? Okay, so for this, to, to, to build an example, we need a Lie group that acts transitively on the circle. Okay, so what are our possible Lie groups? Um, example, I gave you one example already. Uh, there was PSL2R. Uh, another Lie group that acts on the circle? Yeah, S1, that's great, or like SO2, whatever you want to call it. Okay, and if you're not thinking of anything else uh, that acts transitively on the circle, that's because there's basically nothing else. Okay, there's another thing, that, there's one sort of silly thing you can do. Um, the circle, right, is a k-fold cover of itself. Okay, and if you take an action of PSL2R here, you could take all of its lifts, to this cover, and you'd get a central extension of PSL2R by a cyclic group of order K. Okay, so the lifts of a PSL2R action down there up to here will give you some central extension of PSL2R. So you also have uh, extensions that look like uh, a finite cyclic group by PSL2R. Okay, these are just the groups of all lifts. Okay, and uh, fun exercise. This is a complete classification. Okay, uh, the way to, that you approach this is you think about um, if your Lie group, you know, the, if you have a group that acts transitively, group mod a stabilizer of a point will be a circle topologically, okay? And so that gives sort of a smooth structure on your circle where the group acts, okay? Thinking of it as a, the quotient, uh, sorry, the quotient by the stabilizer of a point. And then you want to say like, what is the possible dimension of the Lie algebra given you're acting on this one dimensional thing? Okay, so you can't, you just can't have too many independent vectors. Uh, and your Lie algebra ends up being at most three dimensional and there you go. Okay. So hint. E algebra Okay. That's first. Okay, so that's the possibilities for G. The groups that sit inside such a group is a co-compact lattice. Uh, gamma in that case, well here gamma has to be finite. Here it's uh, virtually a surface group, and here also virtually a surface group. So gamma up to finite index
okay, um, must be the fundamental group of a surface. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm just going to focus on when it's equal to the fundamental group of a surface. This already gives you lots of examples. Okay, so geometric actions of surface groups come from uh, the one that we just saw before, you put it inside of PSL2R. Okay, which acts on your circle by Mobius transformations. Okay. Or uh, you could put it inside one of these lifts by, by taking a lift. Uh, so I've got this G above here. Okay, and whenever this lifts, you get a new example. Mm -hmm. okay. So you might ask, wait, can this ever, can you ever actually lift and get a real action of an actual surface group on here? Um, well, what's the obstruction to lifting an action of a surface group here to a k-fold cover? If you think of our presentation of the surface group with one relator, you're supposed to do a product of all your commutators and get the identity. So if you chose arbitrary lifts of uh, your commutators, you'll take their product and you'll get, well, some covering transformation, something in Z mod KZ. Okay. And if that happened to actually just be zero, right, the identity, then you've really lifted your action. Okay. Oh, but how can I tell what element you get? You're supposed to do, take arbitrary lifts of your commutators and see how you compose them and see how far around you get. That's exactly how we computed the Euler number on the first day. Okay, so uh, this lifts, this, uh, let's call it, I don't know, row hat, if this is an embedding in here. Row hat, a lift exists if and only if uh, the Euler number of row is divisible by the degree of the cover, okay. This is true for any action. If I put it into PSL2R, these are the ones with Euler number 2G minus 2, okay. So in these examples, this is equal to 2 plus or minus 2G minus 2, okay. So it's just a question of whether this number is divisible by K or not. For each of its factors, I have lots of lifts. Okay. Okay. So this in particular gives me lots and lots of geometric examples. All right, and here's the theorem that got me onto this whole track that sort of says that uh, Matsumoto was, was thinking the right thing. Okay. All of these geometric examples of actions of surface groups on the circle are rigid. They have no non-trivial deformations, they're isolated points of uh, the character space. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, because there's lots and lots of them with the same Euler number, okay, for every particular k, so if I take a lift like this, the Euler number of the new representation will be the Euler number of the old one divided by k. You can check that from the definition by being like, well, how many times do you go around this circle? Uh, you go around this one k more times. Okay. So for each, each, each choice of lift to a fixed g gives you a representation with the same Euler number. If you take different choices, like if I have, you know, down here, one of my generators might have, will have fixed points. 
And I can take a lift that has fixed points, or I can take a lift of this generator that is that one composed with a deck transformation. And these are non-conjugate uh, actions on the circle. One has fixed points and one does not. Okay, so for each ch choice of lifts, I get a different non-conjugate action. This gives me lots and lots of uh, representations with, diff with the same Euler number. Each one of them is an isolated point. Each one of them is in a separate connected component. So this in particular showed, or I'll say calorie, is that the Euler number doesn't distinguish connected components. And the main ingredient of the proof or one main ingredient of the proof is actually something I told you last time um, was this algorithm for computing rotation numbers of products and rotation numbers of commutators um, due to Caligari and Walker. Walker. The pictures of ziggurats we did last time and the proof of that the ziggurat picture is accurate. Um, that lets you compute rotation numbers. So I'm really thinking about working in the coordinates on this space. We saw rotation numbers gave coordinates. Coordinates are given by, given by rotation numbers. You want to understand uh, that you can't continuously move changing coordinates from one particular representation that's a geometric example to anything that looks different. And you do that by a lot of analysis of kind of combinatorial structure of fixed points and periodic points. Okay, okay so I'll, at this point I was feeling optimistic and thinking that like this is really the only reason rigidity arises. I tried to make other examples because you always want to generalize your theorem when you're like this is a nice theorem but it would be better if I had more examples. Um, and that's just not true. So the theorem I really want to talk about today is the converse. Okay. Which I proved with uh, Maxime Wolf. Uh, end of last year, beginning of this year, um, is that the converse is true. So if you have a representation of a surface group, or let's say a row, a, a semi-conjugacy class, so you're thinking of this as an action of a group on the circle up to semi-conjugate. See, if this is rigid, so an isolated point, okay, then rho is up to semi-conjugacy, that's all that's defined, one of these examples, it is geometric. Okay. So uh, a faithful embedding as a lattice in one of these Lie groups. Uh, one of these extensions of PSL2R. So I think this is a beautiful example of when in mathematics things happen only for the right reasons sometimes. Here the only source of kind of a dynamical property is an underlying sort of geometric Lie group lattice structure. Uh, and I want to prove uh, in the rest of our time today a special case of this theorem. Okay, where the special case will be much easier but indicative of the general case. We, sort of, we actually proved the special case first and we're like, alright, if we just work 17 times more hard, the same outline should give us the general one. And it took three more years, but eventually, you know, that, 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 that it, did, it did play out. Okay. 
So we're going to do the proof that rigid implies geometric in a special case. Okay, and what's this special case? Um, we'll show a kind of the best converse to Matsumoto's original theorem that you could hope for. Okay, so we'll show the following. If rho is rigid, and we make kind of the minimum assumption that will exclude all of these lifted examples. So remember the lifted examples, you divide the Euler class by k. You divide 2g minus 2 by k. In particular, you could always divide it by 2, right, and get a representation with Euler class plus or minus g minus 1. So we want to exclude that and all the ones that come from dividing by bigger numbers. Uh, so I'll exclude that by saying if rho is rigid and the Euler number of rho is at least uh, g in absolute value, so maybe greater than g minus 1 in absolute value. So I couldn't have come from a lift. Okay. If this, then, mm, I'm out of space, then uh, up to semi-conjugacy, Uh, rho comes from, rho factors through an embedding into PSL tour as a lattice, okay, which is acting on the circle in the usual way. So we'll can keep this example, this picture in mind, but I'm not actually going to talk about lifts. Okay, okay so that's what we're going to show. Uh, let me put this down here so I have some more space, but I can still point at it. Uh, so then comes from a PSL to our discrete faithful representation. Okay. Here's a nice summary. All right, so that's our goal for the rest of the time here. Okay, um, one simplify, before I sort of embark on the proof, one simplifying assumption that I'm going to make sometimes um, uh, is it's, it's, sometimes it's a little annoying to speak of representations up to semi-conjugacy. You don't know exactly what they look like. You could blow up things, you could collapse them. Um, but we want to sort of have a canonical representation, representative so we know what they look like. So just a useful cool okay uh, is the following fact if you have an action of any group on the circle uh, that doesn't have a finite orbit okay things with finite orbits are semi conjugate to actions by rotations um, if you have something that doesn't have a finite orbit then there is a unique up to actual conjugacy uh, representative for rho in its semi-conjugacy class. Uh, And uh, there's a special unique optic conjugacy one that 
is minimal in the dynamical sense. So an action of a group on a space is minimal if all orbits are dense. So let me throw in this definition. All orbits dense. Okay, so the picture you should have of a semi-conjugating map is you could take an action of a group on the circle and you could pick a point, you could look at its orbit and you could like blow it up replacing every one of those points by a little interval. Like conjugating it by the Cantor staircase function turned sideways where you insert little intervals everywhere. Okay, that is no longer minimal. It doesn't have dense orbits. It's got intervals that wander around. But you can undo that process as often as you need to to get a minimal action, one where the orbits are dense. Okay. Uh, actions with finite orbits, so finite orbit, these examples are never rigid. Okay, they semi-conjugate to actions by rotations. You can change, you know, if it's now like a, basically a representation to SO2 and you can change rotation numbers. You can change this a lot. So, um, our examples here, if we're starting with a rigid representation, it has this kind of canonical minimal representative, and that's a nice thing to think about and look at. So we can assume, if we're talking about things up to semi-conjugacy, we can assume they act minimally. Okay. Okay, so we'll, we'll often make the assumption. Often assume rho is minimal. All right. And let me do this proof in, in sort of three big steps. So step one. Okay. So in step one, I'm going to use this hypothesis on the Euler number to get some dynamical behavior of specific uh, elements of my group. Okay. So let's write, uh, let's pick a set of generators, A1, B1, all the way to A, G, B, G, usual generators. One relation, a product of the commutators, is the identity. Okay. And we're going to show by a little Euler number computation that if the Euler number, uh, oh, so Suppose you have any representation. I don't need to be rigid yet. Mm. Sure, I'll just do this as a little lemma, uh, and that way I can state it like this. Suppose you have any action of the group uh, on the circle. Um, that has Euler number bigger than g minus 1. Okay. So I could say the absolute value, or let's just assume it's a positive number at least this big. Uh, the negative case less than that will be the same argument. Okay. Then uh, the rotation number of one of these commutators, so I look at row a i, row b i. I take lifts, I take their commutator. Remember this is a well-defined uh, homeomorphism of the line, so I can take its rotation number. It's independent of the lifts that I chose. That's something we showed on day one. Okay, this number is pretty big. It's at least one for some i. And actually, I could change that to being equal to 1 because uh, one of the properties or part of the milner wood inequality is the statement that this is at most 1. Okay. So I can equivalently change this to equal to 1 if you want. 
Okay. So this is a, a lemma that tells me that uh, one of these commutators acts on the circle moving a point pretty far. And it has a fixed point. Okay. Uh, so let's call this lemma. I'm going to prove it, and then I'm going to kind of deduce an amazing consequence that says I basically know what a will, what what a i and b i look like on the nose. Okay, so let's prove this first. Um, and this is so recall that Euler number equals n meant that. If I take the product of all of these commutators, row A1, row B1, I take their lifts, and I compose all the way down, row AG lifted, row BG lifted, I get a translation, and that's translation by N. Okay. There's a homeomorphism of the line. That was our definition of, or the Milner's definition, basically, of Euler number. Okay. And uh, I know each of these is at most one. I want to show that one of them has to be equal to one in order for me to get something that is at least g minus one. Okay. So here's a little observation. Okay. That if I take a homeomorphism uh, of the line that comes lifted from the circle, and its rotation number being negative is equivalent to saying that for every point of the line, F moves it to the left. Okay. So why is this? This comes from the definition of rotation number. Uh, if, if f has a fixed point, we could take that as our origin, and then you iterate, and you take a limit, and you're not moving anything at all. So the average amount it translates is 0. Okay, so if there's a fixed point, it's going nowhere. If there's a point that increases, well, if I, as I iterate and I move to the right, on average, I'm moving at least 0 distance to the right, possibly a positive amount. If I iterate f, I will never go backwards. Okay. Um, so that's that statement. And equivalently, right? Um, so, well, so what this means is, is this is this is a property that's preserved under compositions, right? So, if the rotation number. of a whole bunch of functions is less than zero. This implies that the rotation number of their composition, say g of them, is less than zero. Right? This property is preserved under composition. Okay. So using this observation, uh, let's prove uh, kind of the contrapositive of this. Okay. So now, suppose that this is not true, namely, one of the uh, for all i, this is strictly less than one. Uh, oof, let's use notation. I already used f i. Let's call uh, this homeomorphism. Let's call this, let this denote fi, be denoted by fi. Or I guess I was putting little squiggly hats to say we're homeomorphisms of the line. Okay, so suppose uh, the rotation number of, of each fi okay, uh, was not equal to 1, but was strictly less than 1. Okay. This means that if I compose with a translation by negative 1, I'm supposed to subtract 1 from its rotation number. Translations commute. I can move them in and out using properties of rotation number. This says that the rotation number of 
fi composed with translation by minus 1 is less than 0. Okay. So by the observation, the rotation number of the composition of all of these is less than 0. Okay, so that's F1 composed with T minus, oh, but the translations commute with all of the Fs. If I came from a homeomorphism of the circle, I commute with translation by 1. So I can save these all up for the end. F2 composed with, composed with Fg, and then I had G translations by minus 1 in there, so composed with T minus G is less than 0. Okay. Ah, but uh, uh, we have a nice property of rotation numbers that if I compose with an integer translation, I can just add that number. Okay. So this is equivalent to saying that the rotation number of this is less than G. Okay. So this implies that the rotation number of my whole composition, let me just do it here, whoop, so this guy minus g is less than 0, or this one is strictly less than g. Okay. Okay. Uh, but if you're strictly less than g and you're supposed to be an integer, because I'm uh, uh, supposed to be actually an integer translation, then uh, I must be uh, at most uh, so g minus 1. Okay. Okay, so rearranging this, I get the rotation number of this guy is less than g. Okay, and since that's supposed to be an integer, it is at most, most g minus 1. Okay, and that proves the contrapositive of my claim. Okay, so just a kind of a cute little computation once you sort of understand how to manipulate things in the right way. Okay, okay so let me finish step one. Uh, the point of step one is actually to get uh, to kind of get a handle on the dynamics of a single homeomorphism. Okay. okay. So the next claim, if rho, I didn't make any assumptions yet. Okay. Not only has uh, order number at least g, but also um, additionally uh, is minimal and rigid. I'm allowed to su assume minimal by our little useful tool. Okay. Uh, then there exists a generator, okay, some AI or BI, okay, uh, that is hyperbolic. So what do I mean by hyperbolic? This is just a statement about homeomorphisms that describes a homeomorphism up to conjugacy, okay. So this means that on the circle, it has exactly two fixed points. Okay. And one of them is a source and one of them is a sink. So I'll indicate this like this. If you like drawing axes, you could draw it this way. Okay. Okay, so this is a complete picture up to conjugacy. To specify the conjugacy class of a homeomorphism of the circle, you need to specify the closed set, which is the set of its fixed or periodic points. Okay, tell me if they're fixed or if they're periodic. Um, and I guess provided it has fixed points, um, and uh, then specify on each complementary interval whether you're moving to the right or to the left. 
that's enough to specify um, the conjugacy class of a, of a homeomorphism that has a periodic orbit or fixed points. Okay. So here's my definition of hyperbolic, says looks like that. Okay, so this is amazing. Uh, I'm going to already get something that says, well, at least one element, and in fact, it's something that's a standard generator represented by a simple closed curve in your surface, looks just like it should in, this, in the geometric representation to PSL2R. Here, all the generators are hyperbolic. Okay, and genuinely hyperbolic in the sense of Mobius transformations or like matrices in PSL2R. Okay. Okay, so how am I going to prove this? This is kind of crazy. Uh, well, I have one fact already. That's that there's some pair. Okay, so from the lemma, okay, for some i, I don't know, without loss of generality, say it's one. Okay, um, we have that the rotation number of this commutator, when I take lifts, rho bi is equal to 1. Okay, what does this actually mean? Okay. This means that if I choose lifts of AI and BI to the line, so this commutator, right, is uh, rho AI inverse, I think this was my convention, rho BI inverse, rho AI, rho BI. I like writing things this way because I'm thinking about homeomorphisms and I'm like doing them function composition order. Um, if I compose these, all of these things, uh, uh, and I apply it to some point, I, whoop, and these are all my lifts, I'll do AI inverse BI inverse AI BI and I'll move one over to the right. Okay? Uh, in other words, if I draw that picture back down on the circle so I don't have to worry about what point I chose, uh, there's some point here, okay, so that if I apply AI inverse, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to emit the row just because I'm lazy, okay? If you've got points labeled on the circle, we'll know it's by the action. Okay, so if I apply AI inverse, and then I apply BI inverse, and then I apply AI to that, Okay, so I've done AI inverse, and then I do BI inverse, and then I do AI, and then I do BI. I come at least as back as far as I started. Okay. If, I, if I choose the point where this is a, a fixed point for this, or it's translated exactly one, I'll come back exactly where I started. Okay, so you might ask why do these have to be in this order? And that's something to, to, so I drew a little cartoon where you like go a little bit and then you go a little further and then you go a little further and then you go a little further and you're like, well, why, why can't you backtrack and do AI inverse and then do like BI and then do AI? And you have to check that you break the circle if this happens. Okay, um, so, so that's an exercise to check that these can't be in a different cyclic order. But in this cyclic order, let me draw a bigger picture so you can see at the back. I have a point. I have its image under AI inverse. So in other words, this point goes to this one under AI or A1. What I, would, I called it one because I didn't want to write I's and then I didn't use one. Um, and this point goes to this point under A1. Okay. Okay, so what does that, that mean? That means that this interval here, since A1 is preserving orientation on the circle, this big interval goes to this small interval. And under its inverse, this big interval goes to that small interval. In particular, A1 has to have, it, it maps an interval, the big one here, into itself. So it has to have some fixed points here. 
maybe only one, but it might have a bunch a priori. Okay, and these look kind of like attracting fixed points, right? There's an interval, big interval that's shrunk smaller, and if I iterate it again, it'll get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and eventually limit onto some fixed points. Okay? And the same thing happens for the inverse. So there's some fixed points. Okay. Uh, and a similar thing happens for B, right? I have these two points, and if I apply, oh, if I take this one and I apply B1, I get this one, because the inverse was going the other way. And if I take this one and I apply B1, I get this one. Okay. So by the same kind of argument, B takes this big interval here to this small one. So it's a contraction here, or I mean, I guess it, it takes an interval inside itself. It must, after you iterate, it must have some fixed points in here and some, some fixed points here. Okay. okay, this looks pretty good. This looks actually quite close to the picture of the usual action of A1 and B1. Uh, let me motivate us by reminding us of the geometric picture. Okay, so my standard generators, if here's my base point, uh, they live on some handle of my torus. There are two curves with intersection number one. Okay. And if you look at the uh, representation of the PSL2R that comes from a hyperbolic structure on this surface, those curves, or the geodesics isotopic to them, form the axes of hyperbolic elements. Okay. That I didn't orient these, but with some orientation they look like this, that have fixed points that are linked like this. Okay. So here I've got kind of a badly semi-conjugate picture, sort of, at least on the level of the generators, where I've got some fixed points for B that link the fixed points for A, and A is like an attractor repeller uh, otherwise, and B is like an attractor repeller otherwise. Okay. Okay. Um, but uh, actually, it's better than just A and B looking kind of as they should. I claim that this picture is basically enough to conclude that uh, the restriction of the action to just the subgroup generated by my A1 and B1 is semi-conjugate to uh, the minimal version of this. Okay, So uh, a geometric one. And I'm always sort of helping myself out by taking the minimal represent, represent, representative. If you take the minimal representative of this, so there's, there's really no rest of the surface. Uh, it's the version that comes when, if I look at their commutator, it's some kind of parabolic element. Okay. So on my surface, their commutator is represented by this curve. Okay. So I want this to be like a, a cusp. So the commutator of A1 and B1 has a single fixed point and is doing something like this. I'm not too worried about orientation, I just want to draw the picture. Okay. That action is minimal, all orbits are dense, so that's a reasonable to say, thing to say that you're semi-conjugate to. This one is just a blown up picture of that. Okay. Okay. Uh, and the idea of proof, so I'm not going to give all the details or we'd be here forever. Okay. Is actually the same kind of idea uh, that, came, that, that got hinted at at my colloquium talk which is you, you just try and prove the ping pong lemma. Okay, so A and B, are, except for this sort of point uh, where there's some overlap here, uh, A and B are playing ping pong. There's a region, the A takes the complement of, sorry, complement of this region into that region, B takes the complement of this region into that region. Uh, 
uh, that enough is, is enough to determine the cyclic order of a point, okay, which tells you an action up to semi-conjugacy. You sort of know what the order is a point of a point going anywhere in the circle. Okay. You prove the ping-pong lemma. This lets you recover the the cyclic order of a point on the circle just just from knowing this kind of dynamics okay and it's the same thing you know here b takes the complement of this region so it's like uh, these were my two points there to over here and a takes these two here to somewhere over here okay. it's the same kind of picture okay so if you play the game, we're like, oh, I take this point, B sends it here, A sends it there, B sends it here, and you play the same tracking game for any word, you'll see that the points, the cyclic order of a, the orbit of a point agrees. Okay. And that's enough to build you a semi-conjugacy of the actions.